Hello, everyone. Welcome to our focus week on urinary tract problems and kidney disease in both dogs and cats. And today, kitty cat people, today is for you because I have two really fun people with me from the two crazy cat ladies, Jay and Adrian. Thank you for agreeing to be my guest today because you guys are always fun. <laughs> uh, this is the best time. Any time spent with you, it's just amazing. Oh, so thank you fun. so much for asking. <laughs> So Jay and Adrian have had a lot of construction going on at their house for a, a while, having to rebuild everything from a, uh, a little water leak that destroyed a lot of things. Uh, so we're really blessed that they were able to have no contractors for a, you know, a tiny little <laughs> moment in time for us to have a conversation. So if we start hearing a whole bunch of commotion, we'll know that they have shown up <laughs> Yes, <laughs> just to make life fun. <laughs> All right. So today we want to focus on, I, I have another interview where I talked to Julianne Lee and we talked about crystals in the bladder for both dogs and cats. And we did touch very briefly on crystals and urinary problems in kitty cats. But today we want to focus on with you ladies, because I know you guys hear about this a lot from your followers, but we want to focus on bladder problems in kitty cats and really uh, look at the problems associated with blockages, urinary blockages in kitty cats, because mm -hmm. it's such a huge problem. How often do you have people reaching out to you about that? Oh, I mean, we just had someone daily. reach out like literally 20 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so it, I would say daily, definitely yeah. weekly if we get a break or something. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's all the time. Unfortunately, you know, it yeah. seems to be one of those um, cyclical things. And a lot of times people reach out to us after their cats have already been blocked maybe one or two times. And then they're like, this is happening again. Now, what can I do? Because they keep, you know, just kind of mitigating the issue rather than getting to the root of the, of the problem. Which is difficult, right? Which is difficult. Can be difficult because with our cats, I mean, we know that diet has plays a, just a huge role in this. Do you find that most people that reach out to you are their cats on dry kibble or are some of them like they, they're converted, they're, they're eating a good diet um, and they're still having issues? The majority, I would say, are on a dry kibble. And then after, you know, that first UTI or blockage, they're put on another dry kibble and which it just kills us. Such an oxymoron here, have some dry kibble to solve a dehydration problem. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. So um, we do have some that are, you know, raw fed, wet food. They've, you know, learned enough about the moisture in the diet and how important that is. Um, and they still continue to get blocked as well. So there's, you know, it's much more intricate, I think when it comes to, especially cystitis, right? Like, which happens to be uh, most of the cases um, that it's much more intricate than just the food alone. Although the food right. will always play a huge role regardless. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the problem with our cats when they have an obstruction, it's multiple components that form the little cork that gets stuck. And so, um, you know, we're talking about mucus production because the bladder wall is so inflamed. So it's trying to make a, a, a coating to, to take that inflammation down. So we get mucus in there, which um, from Chinese medicine standpoint, that's just a phlegm problem. It's snot is phlegm. Um, and uh, then we have a heat problem. We've got all this inflammation in there. So mucus and crystals and any debris that's in the bladder, it forms this cork. Now, have you ever had anybody with a female cat report a blockage? We have. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. much more common in, in male Males. cats. So I would say probably 90% of them are male cats, but we have, um, yeah, some. Yeah. Some. I, I only ever had one. I was working emergency medicine. I worked, I did emergency for 10 years and I had a female blocked cat come in wow. and I thought, well, this is an impossibility because you don't, it's catheterizing female cats is not even something that you ever learn or talk about. Um, I just got really incredibly lucky and was able to catheterize that female cat. It was just, it was one of those, you know, Hail Mary, we're going to give this a try. <laughs> okay. Wow! And it did, I got, I got really lucky and I, I can't claim that it was super competence. Um, I had never done one in a female cat and I was like, nope, we're going to give it a try. Otherwise this cat's going to die. Um, 
But so obviously we need diet changes. Um, and interestingly, Julianne was talking about trying not to catheterize these cats. Yeah, I read it. And read so it. she yeah. said using high doses of antispasmodics to get the spasm in the urethra to stop, do that first. And a lot of times we can avoid having to catheterize them because, you know, anytime you pass a catheter up that urethra, you're causing trauma and more inflammation and yeah. pain and, you know, yeah. blah, blah. So I thought that was really interesting. And one of the things that we started doing after we got our really, our really high end uh, cold laser is we would laser them over the area of obstruction. And a lot of times that would take out enough inflammation that then they were able to urinate and we didn't have to yeah. catheterize. My wow. God. Yeah. What? So there's a lot of really cool tricks that I think a lot of veterinarians don't know about or don't think about. So I know you guys have to give a lot of advice to people. So, you know, you might want to say to them, Hey, Right. Ask your veterinarian if they can give them like a, you know, the high end dose of an antispasmodic, laser that area, and maybe the cat will release that blockage without the catheterization. Wow. Now with those, that is amazing. I yeah. mean, I, the cool tips are just going up. Um, <laughs> it, have you noticed with those treatments, the antispasmodic and the cold laser therapy, what is the reoccurrence? Like more. so, if we so usually in my clinic, um, we we <laughs> in the state of New Jersey, there was this really interesting lawsuit. Um, oh God, I can't remember when it was, but it was a long time ago, where an animal that had a surgery was left in a cage overnight with an e collar, and the, the it was a dog, and it managed to strangle itself. So then the veterinary association said, "You can't hospitalize animals unless there's somebody there with them overnight." Of course. I was this little one doctor clinic. <laughs> we did not have anybody there overnight. Yeah. So if people didn't want to take their pet to an emergency service overnight, we would have to send them home overnight and have them come back yeah. in the morning. Um, so a lot of times if we could, I mean, we were put it, still putting in a lot of catheters. So I would send them home with their catheter and e-collar and tell the people you get to watch them all night. <laughs> and they would, I mean, you know, clients love their animals. Or Some would run IV fluids at home. I mean, they're, they're kind of amazing what they'll do. Um, but we can also, you know, cap the catheter and send them home and bring them back and plug them back in in the morning. Um, if we could keep them on the antispasmodics and if we could get the urine flowing, and then we would do things like I would keep them on the antispasmodics for like five days oh, wow. and it would work, work really well for them. And so once, and then we would do things to calm down the inflammation. Now I haven't been in practice since 2020. There are things that I would do differently now that I didn't even have available four years ago, like the PEA, right. because we know that the PEA is the palmitol, palmitol ethanolamide. We know oh, she's got one little tiny right. PEA. It, it, there it is. Um, so we know that that decreases that bladder inflammation. Uh, it's going to take a couple of days to work, but that, that is something. And so for anybody who has a cat who wants to reoccur, we definitely want to do that. And I know you guys have a lot of your um, feline essentials products. Do you have products specific for urinary tract stuff with the kitty cats? You know, we have, uh, we have a vitamin C supplement that we have Perfect. been using, you know, ascorbic acid, like um, successfully it's now, obviously it's not going to help necessarily stop a blockage or, or uh, pre reverse a blockage. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, for preventative care, as far as, you know, especially because struvite crystals are so uh, common um, mm -hmm. and in our kitties to, to help to, um, you know, uh, dissolve those crystals and it reduces the, the uh, inflammation in the bladder too, just as pure vitamin C does. Um, we have that, but it wasn't until this PEA that it's like, yes, fine <laughs> for these babies that really, that, you know, that really need it. And there's just not a lot. I mean, I, we've been reading studies. There's, we, we saw also some studies on, um, instead of, uh, catheterizing cats with this, they're using the antispasmatic and, there was one study that said like 11 out of the 15 cats um, were, and, and they also put them in a very calm, stress-free environment through the, through the process. Um, and it said 11 out of the 15 cats um, were able to urinate and unblock, right? Um, and then the, you know, the others were not without the, without the catheter. So um, I think, you know, that's great. I also read a, it's a recent study from uh, North Carolina State. Have you heard about this? About doing radioactive 
uh, radiation, radiation therapy, like low dosage radiation therapy for cats, which kind of seems crazy to me. Like yeah. thinking about the side effects of that, like, and <laughs> yeah. along with that last, and they don't have, you know, enough. It was like, no. it was August of last year. So it, okay. you know, I think it, they started in 2021 was, was the that? first, was the first time that they started. And they, Interesting. Uh, they're like, they're ready to go and offer the treatments for cats now. Because so just remedy. Really? And so they're using radiation. See, that makes no sense to me because radiation causes burning of mucous membranes. I must be using a very low it dose because that's like low dose. Very, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. And, they, and it's showing that it's reducing basically the symptoms. By, and the reoccurrences. I'm like, PEA, the, 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 come on. <laughs> we, well, well, yeah, really? Like, okay, the, the, how about we just get them on a species-appropriate diet okay. with a ton of moisture, and then we put them on something to take down the inflammation in the bladder, and then we put them in a stress-free environment. But that's that's the hard part, that stress-free environment, because there are studies that show that over 80% of indoor cats are highly stressed. Yeah. yeah. And it's because now I've seen pictures of the inside of your house and your cats have all these opportunities to climb. And even though you have a lot of cats, they can get away. They have their little hidey holes, yeah. but so many cats do not. Right. So many cats live in a high stress environment. Yeah. And I don't think people realize how important it is for our cats to climb, how important it is for them to hunt, how important it is for them to catch prey or at least think that they caught prey. Um, So I think that the, the mental aspect with this is so critical. Oh, that's huge. Well, I mean, and that's what you keep seeing over and over again is that there's really no definitive uh, reason for why these cats are, are coming, having this issue. Right. And they do say, you know, stress, but it's always, you know, idiopathic and you do all this stuff and things. But I think, you know, again, it's, it's that, idea of understanding cats as a species and what their instinctive needs really are Mm -hmm. and for us as a cat community to get better at really specifically doing our best to provide those enrichments right it's not and enrichments is like a nice word but it really should be more like requirements right it's like (laughs) almost as important as a species appropriate diet right yeah it's what they need to live there exactly yeah yeah, I mean, I don't think we uh, we talk about mental health near what we should. And actually, that is going to be one of our focus months where we're going to talk about the mental health and emotional health of our pets because it is it is highly underrated. <laughs> yeah, and we're learning more and more all the time about how that emotional aspect really affects you know overall health. And we you know we're learning more and more in humans how the emotional aspect contributes to, you know, our health issues or uh, disease. A disease. But, uh, yeah. but when it comes to our animals, I mean, especially our cats, I want to say, well, I say that because we are, you know, cat ladies. So we're with cats all day, all day long. Yeah. Except that, you know, with dogs, dogs are more likely to interact with their owners and more likely to get on a leash and go for a walk and have a smell tour and have a, you know, a different environment. Um, whereas cats are more likely to sit around the house all day and get fed twice a day and maybe or maybe not have a lot of interaction, right. playtime, hunting time. Um, I, th- I think we just think of cats more as solitary creatures that just kind of do their cat thing and, yep. you know, they're just doing their cat thing. Well, and, and that I think is an especially um, significant thing to pay attention to, especially if you have a cat that has a uh, a proclivity towards these urinary issues because paying attention you just talked about dogs and it's so true you're taking your dog for a walk every day or you're letting them out in the yard every day to do their business right you're you're really paying attention to that with our cats it's like when's the last time you saw zoro pee what's the last time you saw uh you know jack pee or whoever it may be and i think that that's something that we hear so often too is that they just don't realize there was an issue until there is a very significant issue right. So exactly paying attention to how their plumbing is working for any cat is so, so important, especially to catch this, you know, that the blockages are the scary thing. Those are, those can be so fatal, but those urinary tract issues are painful and you'll, you'll notice just subtle things that are happening in their behavior, their litter box um, deposits. Are they straining? Are there, they going to the litter box more? Are there deposits normal deposits? Is it just a trickle, right? Like I love I, that you said plumbing. Right. I mean, having your plumbing working 
is li- that's the most underrated thing. Because we're, we're under <laughs> <in> our plumbing. <laughs> it's, your plumbing was not working. But it's very true. So when I have I have two cats that live in the house. They can go out, but they choose not to. Okay. Um, and they each have their own litter box. And it's so funny, they will not share. And I know exactly what I need to clean out of the, I clean their litter box every morning, each litter box. And so there should be two clumps of urine and one poo. From each cat. And so (laughs) if I were to go to the box and if I had 15 small little clumps, I would know. Like, oh, somebody, somebody is, you know, peeing in small amounts more frequently, like something's wrong. Um, They also make those really cool. And I don't know if you guys use them. uh, The, the, the litters that turn different colors that test for blood and sugar and that sort of thing. I have not used them, but I think that particularly if you have a cat who's had a history of problems, Mm -hmm. it could be a really good way to be monitoring. Yeah, Yeah. Um, You could also be crazy like, um, like Adrian and she does like once or once or twice a month, at least, uh, she keeps the she keeps the little I think uh, I little pH, pH strips, on a, quick strips draw. Oh, yeah. on, a, on a quick draw. And then when they're in the litter box, she just goes under and catches the stain. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, "Are we okay? Awesome. Are okay. we okay? okay. Yeah." <laughs> Well, you know, it's not a bad idea. And it's so, it actually is very easy to check urine at home because we also have the uh, litters that are non-absorbent. They're little plastic particles. So you could clean out a litter box, put that in there, and then just dump the urine out into a cup and Mm -hmm. you poof, urine sample. So if you don't want to drag your cat to the vet clinic in a box with them screaming and upset and stress, talk about stress, um, especially if you haven't taught them that it's not stressful. um, You can actually test urine at home or get a clean urine sample at home. And for anybody who's had a cat with a history of problems, you should be monitoring that urine. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if they they go outside the box, then it makes it even easier usually, right? Like, so they go in the corner of the room or something, you're like, well, let's check that real quick. But it's usually a sign as well that that, um, there's possibly an issue. Yeah, I know in the vet clinic, um, we would get these frantic phone calls of, uh, my cat is constipated. He's straining and straining and straining in the litter box. And it's like, yeah, or not. That's always an emergency because yep. it's, uh, nine times out of 10, that straining is not constipation. That's, I can't pee. Yeah, which is so painful. Hard oh Yeah. Here's, here's a question because this is this something that we've, you know, to me, it feels like a common sense uh, conclusion, you're talking about how this is so much more uh, common with our male cats. And, and, and physically, I know that they have a skinnier little urethra, right? <laughs> um, but talking about when we get our boys neutered. Yeah. So that's something, you know, we were talking with Dr. Kozier about that. And she really feels like how important it is to let our boys Develop. grow to, you know, physical maturity yes. yep. before we, you know, do stuff and things. Is there definitive science around this, or is it just a common sense conclusion that maybe this can be? And, and I just also want to say that it's because it's crazy because we I do now ask like I'll just say but hey by chance would did you get your uh, your kitty from a shelter and you know ninety nine percent of the time I want to say is a it's a yes so we so I I'm not saying like you know were they neutered too early or anything like that just like if they got them from a shelter it, it was probably that case. But it's just like, if you do a Google search about when to- Dr. Google. Yeah. If you go to Dr. Google and you look up, is it is it bad to neuter your cats at a young age? Everything, top front page, first page, everything will debunk this. They will say, absolutely right. not. It is, there's no research behind it. It is absolutely safe to, you know, at six weeks of age- it's it's absolutely safe. Yeah, so I've read a few studies on it um, where th- they basically uh, measured the diameter of the urethra on cats that were neutered early, cats that were neutered late, and most of them say there is not a difference. However, there is a difference in some other anatomy, like the barbs on the penis do not develop if they're neutered young. And I think there's, uh, you know, it's more than just the diameter of the urethra that we need to be looking at because we know that hormones play so right. many roles that we don't even know about. Um, but I personally 
did not want to neuter cats before they were fully mature. So, I, I mean, unfortunately, male cat urine starts to smell and people who have indoor cats kind of go, yeah, we're done with this now. Um, but it was funny. My my second job out of school, uh, the owner of the practice, he said, we will not neuter male cats before nine months of age because I want their urethra to fully develop because of blockages. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And of course, I don't think there was any science behind it at that point, but that was his conclusion. And I said, I'm good with that. And so I carried that with me when I had my own clinic. I was like, yeah, why don't we wait on these boys? But then, you know, when I was doing shelter medicine, because we were a mile from the shelter and every Wednesday they would bring me 40 animals to spay and neuter. We were, if a kitten was two pounds, that's eight weeks, they were going to get neutered. Otherwise they couldn't be adopted out and they didn't want to keep them around. So I understand from a shelter medicine standpoint, I get it because people are just irresponsible and they don't, they don't bring them back to get them spayed and neutered. So I understand from their standpoint, but I do personally believe that early neuter is contributing to issues for these cats. Yeah. So my recommendation, if you if you get a kitten, a male kitten who is still intact, uh, try to keep them that way till about nine months of yeah. age. And they don't start to really stink with their urine before that. And usually they're not spraying. And, you know, I don't think that spraying, well, I know that spraying is not a testosterone driven behavior. Yeah. All of my barn cats, all of my girls. Actually, I see my girls spray more than my no, boys. No, no. <laughs> they are marking everything. <laughs> girls. Yep. I mean, don't get us started on that. <laughs> They're coming to the right now. What? Yeah, we can all talk about what parts of our house have been peed on. <laughs> In Jay's case, uh, her face. Well, part of my face has been peed on. <laughs> Oh my but, gosh. Okay. Yeah. I'm not there yet. Oh, well, actually one of my, one of my dogs likes to mark us. He marks our pillows when we're sleeping. So sometimes they're, you know, you're like, yeah, oh, that. so warm. You wake, you wake up. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why is my head wet? That's <sighs> close week for your part. Yeah. yeah. The, the things we yeah. do. I yeah. know. Well, that's interesting Crazy. Enough, though, that that's, that's uh, something that you actually kept in your practice from, you know, before there was any real, evidence behind yeah. it well, and you were- yeah so 38 out of my well 34 out of my 36 practicing years wow. i was neutering yeah i was gonna say cats. so you were in practice for a long time so did you ever see those clients come back with these with these urinary um issues well unfortunately <laughs> um a lot of my clients were still feeding dry kibble And so, you know, what we need is let's look at studies of how many cats block. You know, these need to be long term studies. Mm -hmm. Cats who were not neutered until they were late and they were fed a species appropriate diet. Then you need a group of cats who were neutered early and fed a species appropriate diet. Then you need the same thing, you know, two groups fed dry kibble with early neuter and late neuter. And we, you know, it would be a long-term study because you'd have to follow these cats for a good 15 years or so. Um, but it would be interesting to do. And I, I think that, first of all, we're going to find uh, a lot more kibble-blocked cats, sure. period. Um, and then if we could narrow it down to, you know, age of neutering, uh, we might find different. I, th- I personally believe that we would find differences yeah. there. Yeah. It's really hard to say. I mean, it, now the other common th- sense, a little bit of common sense there, you know, right. like eat, eat yeah. what you're supposed to eat, you know, develop as you're supposed to develop, let nature take its course. And, you know, the stress, of course, as well, too, you know, if you, if you did an environment of, you know, people that are really high stressed with cats and how often they block or have <laughs> urinary issues versus people that are like so chill and whatever. Chill. Yeah. And then the cat's environment, too, you know, indoor, outdoor what kind of enrichment do they have? Yep. That would be oh, awesome. I, all the stuff. I, sure. I want to do all the studies. Someday. <laughs> it's a goal. Okay. Yeah, we just, you know, we need a couple hundred cats and, you know, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and a few hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, right. and <laughs> It'd be easy. So the other thing I wanted to touch on is, do you have certain times of the year where you, you get more block cat complaints? 
or is it you know pretty equal? i have to say we were just talking about the frequency of when we first came on you asking us and we had an email just this morning that kept being blocked for the second time and yes it does feel like it's a daily thing but there was there's a brilliant veterinarian that was talking about the correlation between chinese medicine and the winter months and the frequency and it just all clicked do you happen to know who that veterinarian <laughs> trying to think I don't know anybody who knows anything about Chinese medicine. <laughs> yeah. And I think Dr. Judy Morgan, you brilliant woman, I think that that is so true. So for for people that, because we did an interview with you or we were talking a little bit, uh, touching on this topic and looking at, you know, holistic health is such a fascinating thing and there's just no end to the things that we can learn. And <laughs> while, it, you know, when you look at the frequency of how many times we're contacted or that sort of thing but even yeah. with some of the people that we know it's like uh-huh. oh it's, it's like always the winter around. months yeah what is that yeah and uh, w- before we were always thinking yeah. that it was just the holiday season it was more like well, stress. there's more stress. more stress with the holiday and and that <laughs> definitely can play into it but the water element and let's see the bladder and the kidneys hmm water element uh the peak season for that is winter so january february and i can honestly say in my clinics january and february it was like just unload the buses with the block cats and so and it so you live in an environment where it is warm all year round so it's not just the seasonal temperature it's just it's the season of the element um and so and it's interesting because we saw a lot more urinary tract problems in dogs in january and february as well and i always just said well these are animals that have had bloody urine or urinary tract infections for a while but now that there's snow on the ground people can see the blood (laughs) so they all come in but maybe maybe not i mean maybe it's just because it's water element season and this is when we see more of the problems so because because i'm so fascinated by this so for you know for people in our community how do we kind of in layman's terms help them understand that and also what are some of the things that we can do to help mitigate this season with our babies our kids so we definitely, we basically what happens and the reason why uh, the water element has problems in the winter, particularly where somewhere where you have four seasons. Um, so if we think about the seasonality, what happens to water, free flowing water in the winter? It freezes. It freezes. It becomes stagnant. It stops flowing. Yep. What are crystals and blockages and stones? their stagnation. Uh-huh. They are where everything got congealed and got stuck. Wow. So it's, you know, when you, when you look at things from that perspective, it's like, well, of course things slow down and get stuck during that season for that element. So it's just like, I, I love, this is one of the reasons I love Chinese medicine because there are stories behind everything. And it's like, well, yeah, water stops flowing, it freezes. Yep. So when urine stops flowing freely, we get all the debris and everything clumps together in the bladder. Right. So so really what we need to do is make sure, particularly during that water season, that we are providing, whether it's herbs or foods that promote the free flow of wow. urine. So it's a great time to add things like um, dandelion or celery or any anything, asparagus. And, and cats don't eat a whole lot of veggie matter, but it also doesn't take a whole lot. And you can also buy like um, encapsulated powders of those kinds of things. Like you see the, the, you know, the veggie capsules all the time that are being advertised. Oh. But, you know, you could, frankly, you could dehydrate celery in your oven. And then put it through a coffee bean grinder and poof, you have celery powder. (laughs) You can probably buy celery powder. I know you can buy celery seeds, Um, but little, little tiny things. And, you know, cats are small and herbal medicine in particular, like when we take something and dry it and powder it and, you know, make it very concentrated, you don't need a whole lot. So it's not like your cat has to sit there and eat a whole stock of celery. It's like, well, okay, I'm going to give him this little eighth or 16th of a teaspoon of something mixed in with his food. And he's like, eh. So anything that promotes movement, uh, free flow, 
are the kinds of things that we want to do. So anything that supports kidney health. So when you look at, for instance, a lot of the herbal kidney support uh, mm -hmm. products, you know, that's a great way to find out, well, what things are in there? What, what could I add in small amounts, but you can also buy, um, there's a lot of companies that, that have really good tonics and tinctures and things that you can just, you know, this is the time of year. If they're going to be prone to urinary tract infections, we're going to see more of it or blockages, anything like that. We're going to see more of it right yeah. now. So that's why it's really critical to, to kind of stay on top of that. And if you have a cat who is more prone to these things, now's a good time to really keep it, keep an eye yeah. on what they're doing. Being proactive. Yeah. Well, yeah. because it's the that. scariest thing. I just think it's such a horrifying <laughs> horrifying situation yeah yeah. yeah so a cat can die within 48 hours of being obstructed sure. um, and the reason they die is actually from the high potassium levels in their blood and it stops their heart so uh when they when they obstruct all the toxins back up into the bloodstream because the kidneys are like well i'm trying to push this stuff downstream and there there's a dam at the other end and it, it's not going anywhere so where does it go it backs up and it, it stays in the blood so we've got all these toxins in the blood so that's uremia which basically means urine in the mm -hmm. blood uh, so it's all those toxins and that's why the bun the uh, blood urea nitrogen goes sky mm -hmm. high that's that's the uremia that's the toxins and then that produces ammonia so we get ammonia crossing the blood brain barrier. So we have the effects of ammonia on the brain so we can get mm -hmm. seizures. Um, but then we get these high potassium levels, which will stop the heart. So when a cat is really bad and they've been blocked for quite a while, when they come in, not only are we, you know, feeling their bladder and going, oh my gosh, there's a great fruit in there and it is rock hard, but we're also running an EKG yeah. because we want to see are we having arrhythmias? Do we have a heart problem already? Because that is a much more critical animal. And then we're also checking their um, kidney function because if that blockage has been there long enough, all that pressure is on the kidneys and the kidneys will fail as well. So it's not just a simple like, oh yeah, we just need to put in a catheter and leave the obstruction. For a lot of these cats, you're gonna have thousands and thousands of dollars at the emergency room fixing the kidneys, fixing the heart, fixing, um, you know, the toxins in the bloodstream, getting those electrolytes yeah. back to normal. So it's, it's really critical for the kitty cat owners to catch it early. Yeah. Like let's, and what we would, what we call it in veterinary medicine when they come in and we would, you know, get the urine out, port wine urine, oh. it comes out dark purple, like a port wine. That is not oh. good because that is literally the bladder wall is dying and you've got all this bleeding inside the bladder. And so you don't ever want to see that in your vet records. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. I don't think I ever knew how graphic the, uh, the unblocking could be. Is there, yeah. you know, that time frame is so, you think about a matter of hours, see what happens in 36, 48 hours. It, when, when you're talking yeah. about the issues with uh, things crossing the blood brain barrier, heart issues, kidney failure, how long after, you know, if, if, if the cat is blocked? If you so we can start seeing those changes at 36 yeah. hours um, for sure. So you've got a day and a half. Uh, if we can get to a cat in the first 24 hours of being blocked, usually it's boom, you know, unblock them. We don't have a ton of side effects. Yes, their kidney values might be a little bit mm -hmm. elevated, but they'll usually come right back down to normal. We, you know, get them unblocked, give them some fluids, come right back down to normal. The ones where they've been blocked for a couple of days and we've got that port wine urine and we've got all those EKG changes, you're going to have four or five days of, we hope we get through this. Um, you know, we can make, once you unblock them, uh, you'll, you can get pretty quick shifts in the lab work and the EKG and what's going on. Um, but there's been some damage done that really needs to be monitored closely. So this is like, those were the ones when we weren't allowed to hospitalize things, those guys, they went to an ER ICU overnight because it was so critical to, to watch their EKGs, monitor their hearts, medicate them if needed to get, bring those potassium levels down immediately. Um, and unfortunately, when they're that bad, a lot of just traditional general practices really aren't prepared to handle yep. a cat that's that critical. So if you know your cat's been blocked for a couple of days, 
you need to be taking them to, you know, unless, unless your veterinarian has a lot of experience with um, like ER type and critical care stuff, um, you'd be much better off to head directly to a critical care center or specialty center. Um, because if they have all those things, they're going to be, they need to be monitored really yeah. closely. Wow. wow. It's one of those things. That's one of the scariest things. You don't want to be like, a, you know, your cat could be dying at any moment kind of thing. But, yeah. Cause your you know, stress also affects your cat's stress. So it's like, you don't right. want to be like too, yeah. too over right. the top, but at the same time, it's like, you got to pay attention. And that's why species appropriate a diet is so important. That's why enrichment is so important. Mm-hmm. And all of these, you know, all of these yeah. things that we're talking about, all of this is so important to do proactively. So we don't have to be stuck in this yep. type of situation where, we are rushing to an ER vet and maxing out a credit card or calling grandma for some money or whatever it is to save your cat, you know? It's yeah. Crazy. Yep. And, and really, this is one of those where you don't have days to be applying for credit cards and, you know, like... I, People are like, oh, I, I don't have the money. I'm going to have to go find the money somewhere. You know, let me apply for this grant or this loan or, you know, because there are a lot of groups I and mean, they're right now, they're all maxed out. But um, there are a lot of funds out there that people can sometimes get money from to help treat a pet. But this is one of those where you're not going to have yeah. days to be finding that like you better have a backup plan for like, where am I getting this? <laughs> well, you know, I, I have to say we are not veterinarians. Let me have people contact us like we are like, Hey, yeah. but, and, and I really <laughs> think that, you know, we're, we always go the route of better safe than sorry. Like get your baby to the vet. This is something where yeah. in, in, even in my own experience before um, many, many years ago, one of my very first cats, she was going through something. I had $40 to my name. And I was like, I, I'm just going to the emergency room because, and we'll figure it out from there, right? I just feel like sometimes you got lucky. I did get so lucky. I mean, they put me in a payment plan. It was, and it was thousands of dollars of blood transfusions and lots of stuff. But, um, but I do think with with these situations, often it is just that subtle change of behavior. If you notice that your cat is hiding or being lethargic and you don't, maybe they're indoor, outdoor. That's another thing that a lot of people say is they don't know when they pee because they're indoor, outdoor. You know, my thought is if there's a sudden change in behavior that seems like your cat might be in pain or uncomfortable, then just go to your vet and see, because something like that is pretty easy for a veterinarian to check. Yep. You know, I, I'm not comfortable. Or even take some urine yep. to the vet. So we're not stressing out the cat. If, 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 if they're, if they are urinating, of course, right. um, then, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. But, but we got to be proactive. Yeah. Like, like you asked about the recurrence. And so if we had a cat that we had to unblock and, you know, I would say to the owner, you make sure your CMP coming out of this cat every single day. And if they called me and said, I don't know if he peed yet today. I'm like, run him over. Let me feel his bladder. I can tell you whether he peed or not. And if they come in and the bladder's small, I'm like, hey, he peed somewhere. Well, he didn't go in the box. Well, he peed somewhere. So yay. <laughs> you know, it's like bad for your house, but yay, the cat's not blocked. Um, so it is, it is pretty critical. And if you have, if you have a cat who has had these issues or they've just gone through about, you might want to confine them to a small room or area where you really can monitor. Yeah. Like, is that, is there something in the litter box or did he find a corner? Is, is there, you know, and just even if they pee outside the box, do the happy dance. Yay, he peed. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. This gives me a random thought and maybe we can get you to do this. I like doing like a little clinic, like a hands-on clinic. Cause I know that's something I always love the rub down of our babies, make sure bumps, lumps, boo- boo-boos, whatever, but feeling the bladder, I've watched videos. I've, you know, like as far as like finding it and feeling it, that's why I love going to the vet be like, Oh, we can't get a urine sample. It's empty. Or, Oh, this little guy's full. This is going to be great. Right? Like, <laughs> understanding a from a veterinarian like a little feel through of how to find the bladder how to feel the bladder so if they have a really full bladder it's easy and unless it's unless it's a 15 pound or above cat i'm one i do one hand uh so literally making my hand okay. like this and grabbing up uh on, behind the rib cage um, right under the backbone there. And then put your hand, your hand together as much as possible and then slide down and you should feel a ball, the bladder. And if it's huge, you'll feel a big ball. 
Um, but you know, literally cats, cats are so malleable that you, especially right under the, um, but go behind the rib cage, like right in front of the uh, hips. There's nothing there. The kidneys are kind of tucked up just under the rib cage a little bit. Um, so if you're in the back end there, there's really nothing there. And you can literally put your fingers and your thumb together. Like you can squeeze all the way. And all you have in between is like skin and hair. Um, so when you come down, there's nothing there other than uh, bladder. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, see, I'm we learn something that. new from you every time. I love this. So, you know, on the big fat ones or on big dogs, you got to do a two handed method, but literally it's kind of under the, the, under the lumbar area and then just come down and boop, bladder. Thank so, you. Interesting. Yeah. They're not that, they're not that once you feel one, you're like, yeah. oh, yeah. that was easy. Yeah. Uh, and if you ever feel a block, I mean, literally it's like a grapefruit in there and, and wow. you just kind of go, oh crap like i my owners of blocked kitty cats they could tell wow wow and like you know a good a really good clinician will be able to uh feel the kidneys that's a lot harder for a pet parent to do although i had a cat with lymphoma his kidneys were so big you could see them sticking out each side um but i'm i have pretty sensitive fingers. And so I can palpate kidneys and feel little dimples in them. So if they're, and, you know, basically approximate the size of the kidneys. So it's sometimes you go, Oh, this one's normal size. Oh, this one is a shrunken shriveled little raisin. It's not working mm -hmm. anymore. There's so much we can tell from palpation. And again, it's kind of a lost art. Oh, like, yeah. So much we can tell feeling abdomens. You know, how big is the liver? It should be tucked up under the rib cage. Oh, God, I can feel it way back here. That's not good. Um, you know, that's how we find a lot of obstructions and tumors. And um, I think again, there's so many things, so many arts that have been lost. Like even um, the cardiologist that I've used for ever for all my animals, he says that people that have a musical background are much better at detecting and grading murmurs because it's a musical note. That's crazy. <laughs> huh, oh my so God. Cute. Can we, I'm, I'm taking mental notes on this because I feel like we need to, <laughs> we need to steal you for like four more podcasts. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, one of these days I, you know, actually I'm going to super zoo this year. Yay. I don't, I really, I really hate it, but I'm going because all provide is having a booth. So I said I would go, um, but I should, I should, you guys aren't far. You guys Correct. are in Vegas, yeah. right? We promise to take good care of you. I should come over and we'll just like film a bunch of stuff yes, with your cats. Yes, please. That would be awesome. <laughs> Do you hear that? It feels like Christmas. <laughs> that would be amazing. I can, I can teach you how to feel bladders. <laughs> yes, because that is, I feel like it's so important. And like Jay said, I'm always like better safe than sorry. Bring them in because I don't I don't trust myself to really know. Well, sure, but you know if you're not sure if your cat's urinating and you have an idea about you know where to find the bladder and you go yeah. oh poo <laughs> there's just something big yep. sitting right here and there shouldn't be um, you know and, and a real tiny bladder yeah it's if they've if they've just gone and emptied their bladder it's going to be hard right. harder to find it um, but if they've got a nice full bladder. Right. They're well, and if you do find. find it and you squeeze it and they're like, whoa, and then run to the litter box and pee, then you also don't have to rush to the vet. <laughs> You're like, exactly. Oh. <laughs> Although cats, let me tell you, it is really hard to express a blood, like squeeze okay. and urine out. Uh, dogs are much easier. Yeah. They, they let their sphincter go a lot easier. Uh, kitty cats are like, I'm holding on to that urine. You could squeeze till you die, but I'm not letting go. <laughs> so. <laughs> Like, yeah, I would be like, if I had a cat that was blocked and I thought that he was newly blocked, um, I would be not so gentle about trying to express them because if I could get them to pee on their own, I wanted them to pee on their own. Um, but if they've been blocked, those cats that are blocked 48 hours, you don't want to squeeze real hard because their bladder wall is already stretched and diseased and in trouble. You don't want to pop yeah. the bladder. So, um, you know, if you think your cat's been straining for a couple of days, don't don't give them a good abdominal uh, squeeze. We don't, don't I'm, make it Let's worse. lock this in. That would be so important for so many cat <laughs> parents, though, because this is such a common issue. And yes, we can do all the things to be proactive and 
do our best to mitigate. But that reoccurrence and that stress that you always will have of that kind of situation, just to feel like, oh, bladder's empty. Oh, bladder's full. I'm going to wait. Yes, go. please, Dr. Yeah. Morgan. That's amazing. That would be awesome. All right. I haven't made I haven't made my travel arrangements yet, so I'll I'll leave a day or extra on one end. Um yeah, I actually before I knew any better and my cats all eat kibble, I had a cat who blocked um when he was like four and he kept reobstructing, of course, because he was fed the wrong thing. Um and he had a perineal urethrostomy, which we didn't talk about, but basically that's cutting off the penis and making a bigger opening. And he reobstructed even with his right. PU. And uh, I happened to be on vacation and my uh, associate, who was my boss, called me and said, okay, it's nine o'clock at night and I'm standing here in the clinic with your cat and I've got him under anesthesia and I can't get a catheter up him. I can't get him unblocked. What do you want me to do? And, you know... I was not close by and I just said, do everything you can. And if you can't get him unblocked, I don't, you know, he's not going to die with a full bladder, you know, just put him down if you have to. And, um, he called me back about an hour later and he said, and this was before we had laser and we weren't using antispasmodics. I mean, this was way back. And, um, he said, well, I did two things. I did a cystocentesis. So he, stuck a needle in the bladder and pulled out most of the urine to take the pressure off of the urethra. He said, and then I gave him so much anesthesia that he literally was almost dead, but it was enough for the blockage to release like every, because all wow. of his muscles were like, and he said, and he released and I woke him up and he's doing great. And I was like, wow. Oh, really? Yeah. That's <laughs> I mean, that's, so, that's an <laughs> But it worked. And I mean, the cat lived a, a, a normal lifespan, but that's how dangerous it is. And if you have a cat, even if they've had surgery, they can still reblock. Like, don't don't think that that is the end all be all. It's yeah. an improvement, but they can still obstruct even with that. Well, let me ask you so, one question. I know, like we need need <laughs> I know we need to wrap up, but let me ask you one question because people do come to us quite often and they they say, you know, my cat has blocked. Um, sometimes it's just the first time. Sometimes it's the second time. Um, or it's, sometimes it's just reoccurring and close to blockage type situation. And they, uh, the vets recommend the PU surgery and they come to us and say, should I do it or should I not? And, you know, we, the only thing that we can ever say is like, just weigh out the pros and cons, know that this won't completely stop. Like it's not going to completely prevent a blockage in right. the future. So, you know, but what would you say? D. I would say do everything in your power to not have to do it. So that means having them on the right diet, monitoring their urine getting them stress-free and that stress-free may need mean that you need pheromones, you need, you know, entertainment, you need emotional stimulation, whatever. Um, so you want to do everything in your power. And so then, um, I talked about supplements in another thing this week, but you know, things like cranberry and D-mannose and marshmallow root and uh, N-acetylglucosamine, you know, there's so many things that can be tried to take down that inflammation and stop that blockage from occurring. I would do all of those things, you know, unless it was an emergent situation where it's just like, you know, like if my cat was blocked and they couldn't get them unblocked and the only way to get them unblocked yeah. was to do that PU, I would have said yes, but he already had the PU. So been there, done that. And, you know, so that wasn't a solution. Uh, so, but first time mm -hmm. blockage, you know, why would you do that? And I, I can say in 36 years of practice, I did PU surgeries on maybe a half dozen cats. I mean, very few. Uh, and once I learned how cats needed to be fed and started doing the things that we're supposed to be doing with our kitty cats. Um, the number of my clients whose cats ended up with PUs was very small. Very, I mean, less than a dozen, uh, you know, and that's in a lot of years of practice. So uh, there are so many things that we can do to avoid the blockages and not have yeah. to do that. So I would do all those right. things first. Um, unless it, again, it's an emergent situation or your cat's already been obstructed. 
you know, three, four, five times and Nothing it's, good. you know, you're not yeah. getting well, anywhere with it. And then I, you know, it's kind of, for me, it's the last thing on the list of things to gotcha. try. Gotcha. I love, I love that perspective. Yeah. Cause it's yeah. so true. And it's so sad that you go through something that traumatic and it's not, it's not a cure. It's either, if it right. needs to happen. Yeah. Quick. No. No, you ha- you've just made a bigger opening for all the crap right, yeah. to go through. The The goal is right. to get rid of the crap. <laughs> so get rid of the mucus, get rid of the crystals, get rid of the blood, get rid of the inflammation. Then you don't have right. an obstruction problem. So, you know, it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, so many medications that we use for our animals, all they're doing is treating a symptom. They're not curing the underlying problem. And so that surgery is really curing a symptom it's mm-hmm. it's not stopping the the plugs and the mucus and all that from forming so that's that's really where your focus needs to be like what what is causing this cat to to make yeah. that plug oh, i love that. it go to the root real quick um i know we're way over time with you but i know i we were talking earlier about the amazing studies behind pea and especially how it helps uh, feeling idiopathic cystitis and how that is just such a common issue that will really kind of a snowball into these blockages. It is it is a obviously a very popular product. I think people are really looking at it, but it is a supplement. So can, when people are using it to be proactive, when they're using it to help a cat that has that inflammation, it is not a pill. So it's not like 20 minutes later, they're feeling great. Right. Um, what is your, I always say right. a couple of weeks. Is it, in your opinion, yep. is it a couple of weeks? Is it a month that you want to be, consistent about this to really have that? You want to be consistent for at least 30 days. Um, I mean, some animals, people were saying, oh my gosh, you felt better within a few days. But anytime we are using what we call a nutraceutical, which is a nutritional supplement, um, PEA is something that the body makes. It's just that it's especially as we age or if there's been a lot of inflammation, we don't make enough of it or we don't make it as well. We don't utilize it as well. So when we're adding it back, we're basically adding something that the body makes anyway, but we're giving it at a a higher dose and we're sort of super loading the body with something that is, and the way that PEA works, it works on the mast cells, which are, immune function cells in the body and also the glial cells and the glial cells are sort of the support framework for nerve cells. Um, So it helps get rid of the pain. Where does pain come from? Firing nerve endings. So we're supporting the nerves. And so it's, it's had uh, great studies in humans for interstitial cystitis. And I don't, I don't even know why they don't talk about it more than they do probably because it's, you know, the pharmaceutical companies can't get rich off of it. (laughs) Um, but it's, it's amazing, but I would tell people. And so the thing is, if your cat isn't having any issues and you're using it proactively, well, what changes would you expect to see that the cat was doing well? He's still doing well. Yay. (laughs) And you're being proactive. Uh, All of my dogs get it. Um, All my barn cats are really young. So, and they're on, they're like the healthiest animals in the world. Um, My indoor cats probably would benefit from it. Um, I just have to sneak it into their food. I haven't even tried. Um, They they don't have any issues that I know of, but wouldn't hurt them to be on it. They're older. Um, So, you know, it, but if you have a cat who has an issue, I would give it a good 30 days to see what's going on. And depending on what the issue is, I mean, if you're using it for interstitial cystitis, I would probably use it along with d and cranberry and marshmallow and N-acetylglucosamine. I, you know, I would be looking at uh, Adored Beast has a great product with all those things in it. Um, so I would be looking at lots of things that I could combine and hit them hard especially in that first 30 days. And then once things start to get more under control, um, then you can start backing off on things, either giving smaller doses, giving less frequently. Um, When I was talking to Julianne about this, um, she said that for any cat that has a history of these sorts of issues, that she recommends you go through the easy peasy protocol and you can use it along with the PEA. Um, you know, while you're having that initial problem, but then probably three to four times a year, 
just run through a 30-day program to make sure that inflammation isn't going to come back up, that, you, you know, it's again, it's being proactive. And particularly, this is the time of year from a TCVM perspective. This is the time of year where we might see it. This will be a great time of year. Let's be proactive. Let's yeah. start the end of December or the 1st of January. Put it on your calendar and say, okay, everybody's going to get yep. this for the month of January so that we hopefully have no problems yeah. Yeah. in February. I love, love that. that. That's awesome. Um, You're always taking notes. Taking notes for sure. Take um, notes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, ladies, very much. Now I'm I'm almost hey, looking yeah, forward to Super yeah. Zoom. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it worth your while. Yeah, our babies will love we'll, you. Yeah, and, and we'll have a cocktail ready for you when you yes. get here too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what got me in trouble last time is oh, Super Zoo. Cool. So we're, we're not we're not we're not going to do any head. Skull yeah, cracking. No, we'll do mocktails if need be. We've learned all about mocktails during dry January. Yeah. So, you know, we'll just, it'll be perfect. Whatever. So I have a friend who just went to, um, oh God, where was he? Saudi Arabia, I think. And they don't serve any alcohol. They have bars. Like they're, you know, full, full on look like bars with all the bottles and the stools and the, you know, the bar top. But it's all mocktails, fake wine, fake champagne, fake beer, That's fake fun. cocktails in that, the that, whole country. We just talked to somebody the other day who has a, um, who was A that? liquor store. There's a liquor store in their neighborhood that, or in their town that uh, does not serve any al actual alcohol. It's all like fake alcohol, like mocktails. I was like, really? That's cute. Who was Never that? heard that. Like, that I can't remember. Yeah. But really cool. Yeah. Okay. Well. well I, maybe I need to update the bar in my house to all non-alcoholic well, mocktails. <laughs> I'll be gentle. In maybe, maybe, you know, maybe on in January. <laughs> there <That's> you go. <laughs> all right, ladies, have a wonderful rest of your day. Have fun with construction. And thank, thank you, you as always so for your time. We'll see you soon.